Welcome back to Bombastic Nation and Ting and Ting and Ting. I'm Mr. Giant and I'm back with some more vibes for all you. And someone suggested that I watch this here. And uh, this one is called Battle of the Manzigert 1071 Byzantine Seljuk Wars Documentary. I'm butchering the uh, pronunciations there. You know what I mean? The thing coming down below. Tell me how I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me I'm butchering it. Tell me I'm doing all right. Comment down below. And, uh, you know, let's go ahead and watch this. Let us go ahead and YouTube it, Sim Simmer. Check out this vibe here. The Battle of Manzikert in 1071 was one of the most significant turning points Get in medieval right. history. The Eastern Roman Empire was facing nomadic conquerors, as it had done so many times in the past, but this invasion was different. It caused a cascade of events that made the West and the East, the Christian and the Muslim worlds, clash violently, but in a way that truly connected Europe and Asia for the first time. The initial contact between the Byzantine Empire and Islam did not go in the former's favor. The emperor started losing territories to the caliphate in the first part of the 7th century. The Umiyyads and then the Abbasids were pushing their advantage, and even threatened the capital Constantinople on a few occasions. Fortunately for the successors of Rome, the balance of power changed drastically in the middle of the 9th century. The Abbasid caliphate was struggling to keep centralized rule over its holdings. The Byzantines used this to strengthen their position and restored their control over the Balkans, Anatolia, and northern Syria. In 1045, they conquered the capital of the Armenian Bagratids in modern western Turkey, Ani. Controlling Ani was strategically crucial. On the other hand, losing the traditional buffer zone between the Muslim world and the empire created new problems, and they manifested themselves in the new warlike nomadic force, the Seljuk Turks. Here they come. The Seljuks were a tribe from Central Asia that adopted Sunni Islam at the beginning of the 11th century. Through a series of wars, they became the masters of this region by the year 1040. Their conquests continued, and in the next 15 years, they took control of modern-day Iraq and Iran. The Seljuk Sultanate came into contact with the Fatimid Caliphate and the Byzantine Empire, at the same time, Transcaucasia was vassalized, and that opened a new lane into the Byzantine Empire. In 1054, the Seljuks attacked the Byzantines for the first time by raiding Trebizond. The new ambitious Sultan, Alp Aslan, used this weakness in 1064 to capture ever important Ani. The Empire's defensive strategy relied on a chain of fortresses stretching from the Caucasus to Syria. The fall of Ani opened up territory from Kars to Edessa, and shortly after, the fortresses of Malaskert and Alat near Lake Van were conquered, becoming operational bases for future invasions. In 1067, Antiochia, Melitene, and Caesarea were raised by the Seljuks. The gates to Anatolia were now wide open. Emperor Constantine of the Ducas dynasty passed away in 1067. His widow Eudokia recognized the dire situation the empire faced and was eager to limit the power of the Docus. So she married a member of a Cappadocian military family, General Romanus Diogenes. The new emperor was anxious to drive the Seljuks away and even plan. You know, I wonder <laughs> how does that feel? to marry somebody for political reasons per se you know and i'm not talking about somebody marrying somebody because they're in, in politics and they are you know they are power not that at that level i mean but marry them because it would help in a war situation or it would help stop a war or it would help strengthen you or your people in a war against somebody else do they eventually start loving each other? I mean, I can't imagine marrying somebody with no love involved. 
I wonder what was the dynamics of the relationship, you know what I mean? Do they even care for each other? No, yo, for a, a guy, he's going to go, hmm, a woman, bada bing, bada boom, you know what I mean? Especially if he's egotistical, you know, and usually leaders are relatively egotistical, you know what I mean? So he's going to do what he's going to do. Uh, but, you know, can you imagine that? And especially when you marry somebody that's not... from your nationality or your traditions, you know what I mean? Then you have to like pretty much change everything because I would assume that back then the woman had to change everything, the name, the everything, you know what I mean? But I, that, that's got to be something that's living like that. It's got to be. Let's get this going here. I was anxious to drive the Seljuks away and even planned to take Iran, Iraq, and Syria. In March of 1068, Romanus amassed a new army and marched towards Caesarea. He received news that Neo-Caesarea had been raised by the Turks and was able to intercept part of their army near Tefrike, where he gained a complete victory. By 1069, the situation started to get out of hand as a new raiding army attacked Melitene and then Iconium deep in Byzantine territory. Romanus knew that he had to end the problem and started gathering a large force. At the same time, Alp Arslan was fighting against the Fatimids across the Levant. The Sultan was not sure that he could fight on two fronts, so he sent an emissary to the Byzantines. The Seljuks promised to stop their raiding, but the Sultan was not able to control every vassal tribe, so minor raids continued. Romanus kept recruiting troops and adding new mercenaries to his force. Historical sources diverge wildly from the very modest 40,000 to the fantastic 400,000, but it doesn't seem possible that he could have gathered more than 100,000. Mr. Chairman. Troops stayed in Constantinople and Thrace, as the empire was also at war with the Normans of Sicily, making an attack on its Balkan holdings possible. The Byzantine army was truly multinational, as it included Normans, Cumans, Bulgars, Syrians, Armenians, and Slavs. Serving in the Byzantine army was both prestigious and profitable, so emperors were able to choose. You know what I've noticed about these religions? Allegiances come and go. They might be aligned with somebody in one century, in the next century a different one, the next century a different one. You know, they just, there's mercenaries, they, they just all, you know what I mean? So, so if, if it's so mixed up, how do they start conflicts now? Especially since they were allies with this person before, allies with that person before. You know what I mean? Is it because certain people take from history what helps their political cause. Ah, interesting thought. I'm not saying that's what's happening, I'm just saying. It's from the best the medieval world had to offer. In February of 1071, Romanus sent an emissary to Al Basla to renew the treaty, and as the latter was besieging Fatimid controlled Aleppo, he happily agreed. However, the Emperor's plan was more cunning, and he embarked on the campaign against the Seljuks in March, which probably means that his ambassadors were spies, judging the strength of al Baslan's army. The Byzantine Emperor planned to take control of Seljuk fortresses near Van to stop future raids. In July, Romanus reached Theodosiopolis. The Sultan learned that a significant Byzantine force was on the move towards strategic Manzikert and Alat. He abandoned the siege of Aleppo and moved into modern-day Iran, where 10,000 warriors joined his army. This swift movement allowed al Arslan to hide from the Byzantine scouts and travel via a route unknown to them. Romanus ignored his general's advice to await reconnaissance on Seljuk forces and moved towards Manzikert. The Emperor divided his army and sent 30,000 to defend a passage to the west of Lake Van, as that was the direction from which he expected the Seljuks to counterattack. He was sorely mistaken. 
Alp Arslan used his army's mobility and advantage in scouting to move around the eastern banks of Van. The mountains to the north of the lake helped cover this maneuver, and he was able to attack the secondary Byzantine force from the north. We don't know much about this short battle near Alat, but it seems that the Byzantines were surprised, as they expected the attack from the south and their positions were not suited to defend against an attack from another direction. Wow. As Seljuk spies were able to spread the news that the Emperor's army was already defeated, the Byzantine force near Alat began its retreat to central Anatolia, despite not suffering many losses. Meanwhile, Romanus took Malazgird on the 23rd of August and began moving towards Alat. The Byzantines still suffered from a lack of reconnaissance, while Alp Arslan was informed about the fall of Malazgird. On the 24th of August, the Seljuks destroyed a few Byzantine units sent to scout ahead. Alp Arslan again moved around the mountain to get a battlefield more favorable to his cavalry heavy army. The two forces finally encountered each other on the 25th of August. Sources claim that the Seljuk Sultan sent envoys to negotiate a peace, but Romanus was confident in his numbers and also thought that his secondary force would soon return and help surround the Emperor. Oh, man. So the Emperor stated that he would talk peace only in the Seljuk capital of Ray. Romanus sent a messenger to the second army with an order to attack the next day and ordered his forces to build camp fortifications. Seljuk horse archers harassed this camp throughout the night. On the next day, Romanus formed up his army to begin the battle. The 50,000 strong Byzantine force was divided into four groups. The Varangian guard and Armenians were in the center under the emperor's command. Turkic, Syrian and European mercenaries formed the flanks, while the Byzantine feudal levy, led by Andronikos Dokus, were in reserve, with orders to support the position that was put in the most danger. The Seljuk army had only around 30,000 troops. It created a crescent with its extreme flanks protruding forward, while its centre, commanded by Alp Arslan, stayed back. Romanus continually moved forward, trying to get into a pitched battle, but the Seljuks were avoiding him and used the usual nomadic tactic of hit and run. Wow. The Seljuk center moved back while the flanks were trying to encircle the Byzantine wings. By the end of the afternoon, Romanus captured Albarslan's camp, but as dusk was getting closer, he ordered a retreat to his fortified camp. The Emperor's order created confusion. Yeah. And in the dark, it seemed that his standard had fallen. The Seljuks used this distraction to attack the enemy's right flank with all of their forces. Andronicus Dukas was meant to help, but his family was feuding with the Emperor, so reserve forces never arrived, oh, and wow. the Byzantine right flank was utterly destroyed. By advancing so much against the Seljuks, the Byzantine flanks and centre had lost their cohesion, so Romanus himself also failed to support against the attack. The Byzantine left was convinced that the Emperor was dead, and so retreated towards Manticurt, while all of Alp Arslan's forces attacked and surrounded the center. Although the Emperor's Varangian guard defended valiantly and killed many enemies, this group was also crushed by nightfall. An ordinary Seljuk soldier made the Emperor his hostage, and Alp Arslan's troops chased the remainder of the Byzantine army throughout the next day. Crazy. I like how they explain this war. This this was really the cool. Sources claim that after the symbolic humiliation of Romanus, Alp Arslan treated the emperor with kindness. They signed a peace treaty in which Antioch, Edessa, Hierapolis, and Manzikert were to be surrendered to the Seljuks, and the emperor promised to pay 1.5 million gold pieces in reparations right away, and 360,000 gold pieces annually. Both sides agreed to a dynastic marriage between the Sultan's son and the Emperor's daughter. They're just giving away the children, boy. A few days after the battle, Alp Arslan released Romanus with gifts and an honorary escort. However, the Dukas family had already installed a new Emperor, and in a short civil war in 1072, Romanus was defeated and blinded, and soon after died from his wounds. Alp Arslan passed away shortly after, 
but his descendants managed to take control of most of Anatolia in the next two decades. The Seljuk conquests brought the Byzantine Empire to the brink of collapse and sparked the Crusades from Western Europe. Thank you for watching our documentary on the Battle of Manzikert. If this video gets popular, we may cover the events that. This was quite interesting, man. Uh, kings and queens, man. Put the go. I've got the link to this video in the description. Go ahead and check it out. Check out Kings and Queens. They got a lot of good stuff on there that you could watch, you know what I'm saying, and thing. And uh, hey, remember, man, you go out there, meet a stranger, understand the stranger, take care of each other. Cool runnings, all right?